Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to be looking at some characteristics of high frequency passives. Now in this video, we're going to look at components that are marketed and designed for operating at high frequency. Now, if you start looking at data sheets, you might start wondering, what exactly is high frequency and how high can these frequencies go and still have component performance be guaranteed? We're gonna break that down, look at some examples and understand what kind of data you should expect and watch for when you're shopping for high frequency components. Let's jump in and get started. What are high frequency components and where might they be used in a PCB? Well, some RF circuits operating in the gigahertz range sometimes need to use SMD passives. Those SMD passives, of course, need to be rated to operate at the frequency range of interest. Where might these components be used in a PCB? Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples on screen. First, we have our power amplifier module project, and this power amplifier is operating at six gigahertz. And if we zoom in here on the output pin of this power amplifier, you see here we have an inductor and a capacitor that form a bias T. Both of these components need to be rated for operation at six gigahertz. Another example is here in our NRF52 module. And if you zoom in here on this impedance matching network, you see here that we have two capacitors and an inductor. These capacitors and the inductor are used to form a pi filter, which then matches the output impedance from the NRF52 over to this microstrip antenna. Those components need to be rated to operate at this broadcast frequency for this module. Now, high frequency passives. If you start looking on, for example, Octopart or distributor websites for high frequency passives, you're actually gonna find quite a bit of variation in the components that are available. Some components that are marketed for use at high frequencies actually don't provide very high frequency operation. Some components provide extremely high frequency operation. It's all about knowing what data to look for in a data sheet. First, let's take a look at some simple component models and specifically what might limit a component's capability to operate at very high frequencies, such as in the multiple gigahertz range. These components are very important for RF boards and it's important that you understand what the limiting factors are if you need to use passive components in an RF system. So in order to understand the operation of components at very high frequencies, we need some kind of circuit model for those components. Of course, if you have watched any of our videos on high-speed design and you have heard about capacitor self-resonance, you know that, of course, a capacitor stops acting like a capacitor eventually due to its effective series inductance and its effective series resistance. And so essentially that means for a capacitor, we have a model that basically looks like this. We basically have an RLC circuit describing the performance of this capacitor. Now for resistors, we have similar effects. If we look at a resistor and draw a circuit model for that resistor, we essentially have some parallel capacitance inside the package. And then we have some inductance due to the internal structure of the package and then we have the nominal resistance. So this would be the typical type of circuit model for a resistor. Now, when we wanna qualify the performance of a high frequency component, we can't just use the circuit model for the interior part of that component. All of this stuff lives in some package and this box around all this stuff represents that package. But remember, this has to mount onto a PCB. We also have to include all of the pads, all of the leads coming out of the end of the package, the solder joint. And then of course we have the transmission lines on the input and output side. And then sometimes those transmission lines come in through a via. So then we also have to have a circuit model for that via. So in order to fully model this, we would need to, for example, for this resistor, include a couple of additional circuit elements on this input side. We would need to include here an inductance, and then here a capacitance from our pad back to our ground plane. Here, this input could again come from some transmission line and the impedance could be 50 ohms, could not be 50 ohms. We don't know, we're not gonna assume at this time. Same thing over here on this output side. We're gonna have an inductance and then we're gonna have a capacitance to ground and then we could also have some output transmission line. Now this circuit model really helps explain why SMD passives 
stop working the way you expect them to when you start to get into the low gigahertz range. And that's one of the reasons that impedance matching networks that you build from these SMD capacitors can have some issues in terms of perfect matching of the impedance. It mostly comes from these components at the end of your SMD case component. The internal part of the package then starts to dominate at higher frequencies and then causes the deviation between the expected performance and the observed performance. But when you're in those mid gigahertz range frequencies, you start to notice the deviation from the pads, particularly the inductance and the capacitance on these, on these ends. This is again one of the reasons why an impedance matching network often needs to be tuned in order to get just the right amount of impedance matching that you're looking for within your frequency range. So let's just focus here on the resistor for the moment, although all this stuff I'm about to say does apply to the capacitor as well. At what frequency ranges can we start to expect that we see problems or deviations from these parasitics from the pads versus these parasitics that are internal to the components. Well, generally these pads will start to exhibit some deviations in the impedance matching in the low gigahertz range. So I'm just gonna call this an order of magnitude of about one gigahertz. Again, depends on the case size, depends on your pad size, things like that. Order of magnitude is in the gigahertz range. Now internal to the package, these parasitics may start to dominate the deviation that you observe once you get into, let's say, the order of magnitude of 10 gigahertz range. And as we'll see here momentarily, we're gonna look at some high frequency resistors on screen, and these resistors are going to be rated for these very high frequencies in the multiple tens of gigahertz. Now, when you start looking at these ranges, even if you have perfect impedance matching coming in and out of this package, in these frequency ranges, eventually you will see the rated performance of this component start to deviate when you get into these frequency ranges at tens of gigahertz. How do we quantify that? Well, we can quantify that in a few different ways. We can do direct measurements, for example, of the resistance at very high frequencies. We could use S-parameter measurements. And in fact, if you look at some data sheets for high frequency capacitors, they do use S-parameter measurements. We're gonna look at a couple of examples here momentarily that show resistance measurements as a function of the input impedance looking into one side of this component. Now that we have a bit more understanding of what's actually happening in terms of the parasitics inside of these components and the connection to the PCB, let's jump on screen and look at some examples from Octopart and we can see what kind of data we need to look for in a data sheet to better understand and predict the performance of these components in a printed circuit board. So here I am in Octopart and let's try looking for a high frequency capacitor first. Now this is where you need to be careful when you're just searching for high frequency capacitor. And the reason is, as I mentioned earlier, high frequency can mean a few different things. It could be high megahertz or high gigahertz. But if we just search for high frequency capacitor and we start to apply some filters on the case size, you'll see here that we've applied 0201 and 0402 cases. And if we start scrolling down, we do start to see a few components that are specifically described as high frequency. So an example here is this Teo Uden capacitor. And you can see here right in the description, it says it is a high frequency component. So Octopart is great for finding this, but of course you should always check specifications if the specific specification you need is not listed in the description. If we go into the data sheet for this component, and we start scrolling through and looking for listings for frequency, it can actually be pretty difficult to find what the operating frequency is if we don't see a very clear graph listing the capacitance or listing the return loss or the insertion loss for this component. One thing you can try and do is, of course, search by the unit, searching through here by frequency. What you can do is you can find some ratings for frequency, but of course, it may not be clear exactly where that delineation is between ideal capacitor performance and actual capacitor performance as you reach to high frequencies. So some of these components don't necessarily have the best data tabulation uh, listing their performance. Now, one thing that we can do if we're having trouble finding the spec that we need in some of these really big data sheets, and it really isn't clear whether or not this is operating in the frequency range we want, is we can just search for, example, gigahertz capacitor. So if I go over here to Google and just type in gigahertz capacitor, 
you see several results come up. And as I scroll down here, you can see some links that I've already visited, and you can even see the frequencies listed in some of these links. So just as an example here, SMD ceramic capacitor at 12.4 gigahertz. That's pretty good. Here you have one at 10 gigahertz. Just as an example, we have two options from Kyocera and Johansson Technologies. Let's take a look at the Johansson options first. Now, if we just go over here to Johansson, they have a lot of different options for high frequency capacitors, and they even have pretty high voltage ratings too, so they could be used in power applications. Next, let's take a look at these options from Kyocera. If I go into the data sheet for these ultra broadband capacitors, you'll be able to see some pretty high frequency ratings. So let's just scroll up here to the electrical specifications. Here you can see an idea of the capacitances that this component provides, and then look at the max frequency values here. You can see that these capacitances are rated all the way up to 100 gigahertz. Wow, that is the kind of thing that you would need if you ever have to build a circuit from discrete, for example, in microwave applications or in radar applications. Now, looking at a max frequency specification is good and everything, but what you should do is actually scroll through this data sheet and see if you can find return loss and insertion loss spectra. That's exactly what we see here in this data sheet. We see the insertion loss spectrum, and what this is telling us is how much power is lost in this capacitor, even though it still acts like a 10 nanofarad capacitor when operating at these high frequencies. Also here with the return loss spectrum, you can see here that it does actually have pretty good rating to 10 nanofarads in this test circuit that they use, all the way up to pretty high frequencies, reaching into the radar range. This is a pretty good example of the type of data that you should be looking for when you're trying to select a high frequency capacitor. Now, we've looked at high frequency capacitors and some of the data we should expect to see in a data sheet for these types of components. Now, what about high frequency resistors? Well, here I have some data sheets from some Vache components, which I found on Octopart. These components are high frequency resistors, and one of these components operates up to 40 gigahertz, as you can see here at the top of the data sheet. The other one is rated for operation up to 70 gigahertz. Do they actually perform up to these ranges? Well, let's take a look at some of the data in here to see if that is actually going to be true. Now, if we just scroll down through this data sheet, and we start looking for some graphs, we'll start to see some performance data here that illustrates how well these components are gonna operate at these very high frequencies. First, we can see up here that we have that familiar electrical model that is used to basically explain why these components will operate the way they do at these very high frequencies. So they have this lumped equivalent circuit here, which we showed earlier on the whiteboard. Now here, when you look at the impedance, what these graphs are showing is the input impedance on a test circuit divided by the nominal value of that resistor and they parameterize this for different resistors. So they're basically showing this ratio as a function of frequency for different resistors that are available in this part number family. So let's take a look at this 0402 component. You can see here that the 75 ohm component looks like it performs really well all the way up to 30 gigahertz. At 30 gigahertz is where you start to see that divergence from the nominal resistance value. And you can see here from these ratios that those divergences can be pretty high. For example, look at the 50 ohm resistor. This 50 ohm resistor starts to diverge right around seven gigahertz. Even though these are 40 gigahertz rated components, you still see that divergence at a pretty low frequency. And then you can see here that the input impedance really starts to diverge to about 60% more than that 50 ohm value or up to 80 ohms once you get into this 30 gigahertz range. So you can get some pretty big deviations in the input impedance. Now you can see that this also varies by package size because for this part number family, of course they're available in different packages. And so as you look through these graphs, you can see similar kinds of deviation in different frequency ranges for different resistors that are being used in these test circuits. Let's take a look at the other component here. Here are these high frequency film resistors. If we just scroll down, we're gonna see something very similar as we start to look through all of this performance data. So eventually we get down to 
the high frequency electrical model. You can see here that they've done a little bit of math here to show what exactly it is they're deriving for this ratio. And then as you scroll down here, you see these familiar performance curves that we showed earlier. So here, again, we see pretty similar divergences for some of these chips. You do see though that this 50 ohm resistor in this example does actually maintain its impedance up to a much higher value. Here we get this all the way up to 10, 20, 30, 40 gigahertz. So this 50 ohm resistor is gonna stay within, it looks like about 5% of the nominal value all the way up to 40 gigahertz. So again, when you see a 70 gigahertz high frequency chip resistor, check whether it will actually operate at that value all the way up to 70 gigahertz. And you don't always have to go through and test it yourself. You can usually just look for this kind of curve in the data sheet, and that will tell you everything that you need to know. Thanks for watching everybody. The next time you find a component marketed for high frequency, just make sure you head over to Octopart and grab the data sheet check for some of that data that I showed in the video, and then you'll know the operating limits of that component. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section, and of course, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.